When you're new to the ER, everything feels urgent and it's hard to know what to focus on. I remember my first few weeks, I was slow, unsure, and constantly second guessing what I should be doing. The truth is, without a clear system, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. That's why mastering the ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation is absolutely essential for a new ER nurse. They give you a framework to assess quickly, prioritize confidently, and take the right action when it matters most. So in this video, I'm going to break down how to assess and intervene for each part of the ABCs, giving you real world emergency nursing tips and helping you build a strong foundation. Let's get into airway. We'll first discuss assessments, then interventions. As we know, the air we breathe follows a specific path in order to get into the lungs. So when we talk about the airway, we are talking about that path. What we want to know is if this path, the airway, is it patent, meaning it's clear and open, or is it obstructed, or is there a possibility that it may become obstructed? Now, to put it simply, if the patient is speaking, the airway is intact at that moment. Your follow-up question is if it's going to stay intact. Is there any chance that it may become obstructed? But again, if your patient is speaking, the airway is intact. Now, let's continue our assessment. We need to look and listen as well as determine if the patient can handle their own airway. Now, what do I mean by handle their own airway? If they started vomiting or had increasing secretions, could they handle them without assistance or would they choke? A quick reason for why a patient could not handle their own airway would be decreased mentation. Let's continue the assessment. Do you see any visible edema or swelling to the lips and tongue? Any abnormalities to the neck or perhaps any facial trauma? After we do that, let's listen. Can you hear audible strider, wheezing, or gurgling sounds? These could indicate an airway obstruction from a foreign body, secretions, vomit, or even the patient's own tongue. Now let's look inside. Is there obvious foreign body? visible blood secretions or vomit does anything look abnormal now when it comes to interventions at the top is intubation is their mentation so decreased that they need to be intubated or perhaps their oral swelling is rapidly getting worse and you have to intubate in order to keep and maintain an airway or on the other hand can you do a simple head tail chin lift or a jaw thrust and open the airway that way perhaps also inserting an OPA or NPA, whatever the situation calls for, and provide oxygen via a bag valve mask. You can do this while other interventions are being implemented that can lead the patient to gaining control of their own airway. For example, if the patient came in as an overdose, for fentanyl, they give Narcan, the patient woke up. Now that they're awake, they can handle their own airway. Or perhaps the patient was hypoglycemic, you gave dextrose and the patient woke up and they gained control of their, of their own airway. Let's continue. Does the patient have any vomit, blood, or secretions that need to be suctioned? That's why it's important that we have suction available so that when it comes to assessing the airway, we can suction things out if needed. And also remember to never perform blind sweeps because you can push a foreign body deeper in. And always maintain C-spine precautions if they're indicated, especially in your trauma patients. Also, Remember that OPAs keep the tongue out of the way from blocking the path of the air going in. But remember that if a patient has a gag reflex, you do not want to place an OPA as it can stimulate them to vomit and they could aspirate, which will lead to other issues. Now, when placing an NPA, use plenty of lube. But remember that if there is facial trauma, you should not be placing an NPA. Now for breathing, is the patient's breathing producing adequate ventilation and oxygenation? We assess their overall respiratory effort. Do we see chest rise and fall? Is it symmetrical? Is their breathing nice and effortless or is it fast and labored? Is it deep or shallow? Is it slow? Is it too slow or perhaps it's too fast? Perhaps they are tripoding. So overall, does it look like they are in respiratory distress? Then a key important piece of information is the pulse oximetry. How is the pulse oximetry? Is it low? Do we need to address it by giving oxygen? And then remember to auscultate. Do we hear good air movement bilaterally? Did you pick up any wheezing, ronchi, or crackles? But again, most importantly, did you hear air movement when you auscultated the patient's lungs? 
Police note that if a patient's respiratory effort is increased and labored, but there is minimal air movement on auscultation, you need to act quick because there is probably minimal oxygenation and ventilation occurring. Also note that labored breathing takes up a lot of energy and it cannot be maintained. So keep an eye out for these patients, especially when they can't even get a word out. Also note, and also note to palpate for possible broken ribs. Do you see equal chest rise and fall? Or do you note a flail chest or no movement on one side of the chest that can be indicative of a pneumothorax? Also, how does the, the stat bedside chest x-ray look? As for interventions, when it comes to breathing, how is the pulse ox again? Do we need to give oxygen? If so, administer via nasal cannula, a non rebreather or a bag valve mask, whichever the situation calls for until more appropriate interventions can be implemented, like high flow, BiPAP, or even intubation if necessary. Other interventions include needle decompression or, and or chest tubes for pneumohemothoraxes. Now let's get into circulation. With circulation, we need to ask if the patient has good perfusion. And we assess this by looking at the patient's skin color, capillary refill, quality of their pulses, blood pressure, heart rate, ECG rhythm, signs of bleeding, and even mentation. For example, if the patient is awake and alert and speaking in complete sentences, we can assume they are getting adequate perfusion to their brain. On the other hand, if your patient's blood pressure is low, the heart rate is high, cap refill is delayed, and the pulses are weak, the patient may be in shock and in need of immediate interventions. So when the patient arrives, we get them on the monitor quickly, connecting the, the BP cuff, placing ECG leads, and pulse oximetry to collect these pieces of information as soon as possible. As for interventions, you get your patient on the monitor, get IV or IO access, and consider starting fluids, blood products, or even vasopressors depending on the likely cause of the shock. We address the ECG rhythm if needed. Depending on the cause, you may also have to you may also have to send the patient to surgery. However, fluids are the typical first line agent because they are easily available when the patient is in or getting close to being in shock. But again, for interventions, get the patient on the monitor so you can get a set of vital signs. Get IV access and consider starting fluid in the other interventions uh, as indicated by the patient's presentation. Now, let's talk about disability or neuro. In regards to the assessment, the gold standard is the GCS score. Essentially, it provides a standardized way of determining how alert a patient is, whether they're fully alert or comatose in a numerical form. We talk about GCS scoring on another video. However, the main point is that if a patient has a GCS less than eight, you need to start considering possible intubation. However, the perhaps the most important key point when it comes to altered or comatose patients is that we need to check a blood sugar to ensure that the patient's symptoms are not simply related to hypoglycemia. Again, if your patient's coming in, they're altered, they're out of it, check a blood sugar. We also assess the pupils, noting if they are pearl, pinpoint, or dilated, as it can help narrow a diagnosis for the providers. Remember that opioids cause pinpoint pupils and different toxins and drugs may affect the eyes and therefore provide clues for the providers and the team. Next, how is sensation and motor function throughout the body, especially in the extremities? Are the grips equal on both sides? Can they push pull without any issues? Is pedal flexion and extension equal on both sides? Can they lift all extremities without issues against resistance? Is the patient speaking clearly? Are they alert, oriented to person, location, time, and situation? And for interventions, include giving dextrose for hypoglycemia, giving Narcan if an overdose is suspected, getting a head CT and assessing for head bleed and other pathologies. When it comes to exposure slash environment, we have to fully expose the patient when warranted to ensure nothing was missed. Of course, you want, must keep patient privacy, but you want to ensure that nothing gets missed like a gunshot or a stab wound that you didn't see or needle marks or even perhaps an abscess that may be the cause of why the patient is so sick. We also decontaminate when needed and we check the patient's temperature as well. And finally, don't forget to warm your patients unless indicated. Let's review what we must be doing as the nurse. It starts off with having your rooms ready beforehand so that they're ready for business. Ensure you're adequately stocked with back valve masks, suction, and the supplies necessary to connect the patient onto the monitor to obtain vital signs. Is the POC glucose machine ready to go? Do you have IV poles and pumps readily available? Ensure the adequate staff members that need to be called 
are there. This includes RT, your providers, surgery, or trauma teams, and additional staff when more assistance is necessary. Get the patient on the monitor, place IV access, draw labs, and begin, res begin resuscitating as ordered. Coordinate with CT and X-ray as needed. Coordinate with the OR as indicated. Ensure you talk to the blood, ba the blood bank if needed. Man the crash cart. If your patient gets intubated, you know they're going to need sedation medications, a Foley, an OG tube. If they get a chest tube placed, keep track of the output and the device. For the blood, if you're going to be administering blood, is the rapid transfusion readily available or pressure bags for fluids and keep track of interventions and assessments to ensure everything is documented accordingly. And at the end, which I think is one of the more important things as well, ensure your patient is comfortable as possible, of course, and ensure someone comes to explain the plan to them. By the way, if you're finding this helpful, I created a book and a course to help you save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER. They're meant to take you from a novice to proficient, ensuring you learn a solid foundation that you can build on. The book comes with all emergency fundamentals that you need as a new ER nurse. The course takes it further with video lessons, practice questions, real scenarios, charting essentials, and overall practical tips to help you feel confident and prepared. You'll find the links in the pinned comment and description below. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.